Yes, um, thank you to the chairs for the nice introduction and thank you so much for organizing this conference, which brings clinical neurologists like me and like my group and uh, immunologists and um, scientists of various backgrounds together. I think this is really what is needed in um, ECFS and also in post-acute infectious syndrome. I have no conflicts of interest, but I thought, okay, I should add this slide at least. Um, I will talk about autoantibodies in neurological diseases, in um, post-acute infectious syndrome, and in MECFS, and my um, colleagues have already uh, shown data that which should not be, um, again, shown by me, but uh, let's uh, talk about this data as well. For us, as neurologists, autoantibodies, especially in um, neuroimmunological diseases, but also in autoimmune encephalitis, are a vast field, and it's a it plays a pivotal role in neurology, and more and more antibodies are known um, um, and occurring, and pretty much uh, each month uh, a new antibody is detected um, and, um, and correlated to clinical uh, symptoms. So um, this is um, probably not a really a complete list of what we know right now, just looking at autoimmune encephalitis. Um, in routine laboratory testing. And if we um, take additional methods that we um, have only established in um, neurological labs, um, further antibodies um, without um, specific antigens that have been detected are also known and um, are also can be correlated to the clinical pathophysiology. The most prominent um, syndrome, which um, is, was known before the pandemic even arised, is um, NMDA receptor encephalitis as a result of um, an, uh, an herpes encephalitis, which, which um, was actually um, um, suffering the patient from before. And um, um, this is the most prominent example, and we know that um, almost 30% of the patients um, um, have um, NMDR receptor encephalitis after suffering from herpes encephalitis. Which, why is that important? Because you have to take care of these patients when they are um, leaving the ac acute hospital. You need to follow them in the rehabilitation clinics. And um, when they worsen with their symptoms, you need to be aware that this is um, quite an, an option in, in a lot of patients. And you can see here that in um, herpes encephalitis on the left side and C, um, there is no detection of um, neural antibodies in this patient. And in the relapse um, with NMDA receptor encephalitis, you can see the autoimmune staining. Regarding, post um, regarding uh, other neurological diseases uh, which are known to be caused by antineural antibodies and other autoimmune pathways, this field, uh, this research in this field uh, paves our way in understanding diseases that are actually right now known or supposed to be um, neurodegenerative um, or other pathophysiological mechanisms underlying. Um, I think this will change our in neurology, our way to how we approach these patients, the therapeutic options we can offer. And here is just um, um, a small um, example of groups um, where antibodies um, have been detected and are established and are known to cause the disease, like myasthenia gravis and NMOSD, but all, and NMDR receptor encephalitis, like I just said, but also um, the group two, where antibodies are contributing to the disease, like which is um, known for autoimmune psychosis, and um, also other encephalitis, um, where antibodies are detected, but not always in these patients, um, but clinical symptoms are leading towards a group of um, autoimmune encephalitis patients and they, these antibodies. And then there are also um, diseases which are to date um, seen as neurodegenerative diseases um, or other neuromotor neurodegenerative diseases which also may have um, a neuroimmunological um, background and this is um, seems this is necessary that we are um, further investigating in this field. 
Now we're going to go to autoantibodies in COVID-19, acute COVID-19 disease, post-COVID-19 syndrome, as well as after COVID-19 vaccination. During the pandemic, pretty much every other week, there was a new case series of patients suffering from neurological um, symptoms in mostly severe, um, severely affected patients treated on the intensive care units. Um, and this, those symptoms were also of um, central um, uh, origin, but also peripheral origin. In our own cohort of, IT, of intensive care unit patients, we were presenting um, a group of patients on, which were severely affected, treated on intensive care unit, and showed various neurological symptoms like dystonia, movement disorder, um, delirium, um, but also epileptic seizures. And we were able to detect a numerous um, um, number of um, autoantibodies, which is shown here and which we published. Um, in 2020. However, it was not easy and it was not possible to detect a specific COVID-19 pattern. That was not the case for the acute COVID-19 um, symptoms in neurological patients, and it was not the case in post-COVID-19 syndrome. But we here, we detected um, in patients which showed pathological results in the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Scale, a test we use for detection um, of cognitive deficits. We were able to detect um, significantly more um, a number of um, antineuronal antibodies in CFS, so in cerebrospinal fluid, um, and these were patients suffering from post-COVID-19 syndrome with primarily cognitive deficits. And um, at the same time, analyses of um, patients after COVID-19 were presented showing ongoing complement system activation and thromboinflammation in patients with post-COVID-19 syndrome. And um, with these um, two um, um, manuscripts were, um, were published pretty much at the same time. And so we were still believing that regarding other alternative um, pathological mechanisms, um, autoimmunity plays um, an, a pivotal role in post-COVID-19 syndrome. This led and promoted us to initiate two clinical interventional trials. Um, the POCOVID trial is um, a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial of methylprednisolone versus placebo in patients with predominant cognitive deficits in post-COVID-19 syndrome. Two treatment phases um, were applied and um, patients were analyzed um, regarding the multifactor memory questionnaire. Um, the other um, interventional trial is the EAPAX um, CFS and immunoadsorption study where immunoadsorption versus sham apheresis was applied in the patient's five cycles where it um, were performed and um, it was controlled against sham apheresis. So um, this is necessary from our point of view to generate a real placebo-controlled um, setting. The data of both studies is currently analyzed and we are hoping to present these data at one of the next um, symposium and conferences. But also in COVID-19 vaccinations, people and patients report of ongoing symptoms. Definitely, COVID-19 vaccinations have helped to reduce severe COVID-19 and also have beneficial effects on the reduced occurrence of developing post-COVID-19 syndrome, as shown by um, this Swedish cohort analysis. But um, in Germany, um, um, reports for the, to the official institutions um, have been made and uh, more than 1,500 suspected cases uh, were reported. The reporting system, uh, you should know in Germany, but I think in every other nation, is quite um, dysfunctional in general. Um, that was even before the pandemic. Um, and therefore, we cannot really draw conclusions from the numbers reported of um, side effects. But we've looked into these patients a little closer, and we were able to detect um, in those patients which are actually quite young, but comparable to our post-COVID-19 group, 
and um, reported of symptoms after the first vaccination. Um, most commonly, peripheral um, sensory deficits. So peripheral symptoms um, as well as fatigue um, was reported in these patients. That is a little bit different to the, what we have seen in the post-COVID-19 group. In these patients, more patients reported of fatigue and cognitive deficits. So um, we saw another um, clinical phenomenon here. And, and therefore, we performed um, autoantibody testing on peripheral nerve staining, and we were able to detect antibodies binding to peripheral nerve structures, as you can see here, um, in patients with predominant reported paresthesias. So also here in in COVID-19 vaccination and post-COVID vaccination syndrome, we can detect in a group of patients antibodies. Now to the last topic, autoantibodies in ME-CFS. As you have already seen and my um, um, colleagues have reported, um, they are a little bit controversial and, um, and um, results regarding um, the antibody um, field. Since more than 20 years, researchers um, are trying to analyze antibodies in ME-CFS. In this first study that I would like to present you, um, 60 ME-CFS patients were compared to healthy controls and other patients with autoimmune disease. And um, the um, muscarinergic um, cholinergic receptor index um, was significantly higher in patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and autoimmune disease compared to healthy controls. And also this work um, by Madeleine Löbel, which has also been presented before, was able to detect um, antibodies against adrenergic and muscarinergic receptors in a, a quite large group of um, almost 300 ME-CFS patients. Most recently, this analysis by American colleagues was published and reported of a comprehensive analysis of more than 7,500 autoantibody antigen interactions using two platforms, the Onkyimmune and Augmenta BioX Luminex um, platform and the Rapid Accelerator Antigen Profiling. Um, and here, no significant differences were detected compared to the healthy um, group. However, female ME-CFS patients uh, were detected um, with more uh, and higher levels of autoantibodies in general. And um, maybe this is a link to the talk of Francisca um, before. Um, only an, an increased antibody reactivity to EBV was uh, reported in the analyzed group. So this brings me to my conclusions and the take-home message from my neurological point of view. Autoimmunity plays a role in subgroups of post-acute infectious syndrome and ME-CFS, but one size does not fit all. There's more to that. There are more subtypes of the disease and more subgroups. We need and strongly need correlations with clinical phenotypes and biomarker analysis to transfer and um, actually bring um, these biomarker analysis in clinical care and routine diagnostic to help and support our patients. Thank you very much. Yeah, any, any questions? Here, here is a question. As a neurologist, you have also the possibility to treat outer antibodies in general, or particularly those directed to endothelial antibodies, uh, with this uh, uh, neonatal uh, FC-gamma receptor in myasthenia gravis. Do you have the impression, by treating these patients, that also fatigue is decreased? It's a very interesting uh, point. Um, in myasthenic uh, patients, um, it is not really uh, looked into the study, but um, Fktigimod and other um, autoimmune um, therapeutic agents reduce fatigue in, in neuromuscular diseases. Um, this is, has been shown. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, given the huge variety in outer antibodies, and uh, if you look at 7,000, you find no significant difference, that does not mean that there are no anti outer antibodies. Uh, first, uh, outer antibodies, I think, have a physiological function. In, so you find, after exercise, I find outer antibody as well, yeah, because you need to tag some cells to be destructed afterwards. Um, so what is functional outer antibody and what is dysfunctional? Uh, 
uh, Yoda. <laughs> what is functional and what is dysfunctional? And what should we measure? Um, even there could be autoantibodies, but we did not measure them. So is there autoimmunity without measuring autoantibodies? So I was wondering if this is for me the question. No, I, think, I, think, I think you're actually um, asking the key question um, and you're pointing it out um, from my point of view, but um, I think Professor Schoenfeld has a more in-depth um, um, meaning on this. Um, I believe that um, we, are, we need more, more research, especially, especially on this point you, are, you were pointing out right now, because we, for us as clinical neurologists, we need to detect antibodies in routine care uh, um, and, and, and then draw conclusions for therapeutic um, um, consequences. We have a lot of patients bringing um, back antibody um, um, in serum and, and um, measurements that have been performed, um, but therefore we cannot draw a, a, a consequence in clinical care. We cannot, the result cannot be that every patient will receive an, auto, an, an immune modulatory treatment. But Professor Schwimmfeld. So no finding in court is not an evidence that it does not exist. So uh, in autoantibody, we find quite often very low level or disappearance of autoantibodies. The immunologists claim that they are precipitated in the organ, in the target organ, and that's why their titer is low. But I will take the uh, opportunity to say something about your lecture and the other lecture that mentioned here. Autoantibodies against cognition, against depression, against other psychological and psychiatric manifestation, because you started with psychiatric manifestation. In 1993, in an unknown journal called New England Journal of Medicine, a paper was published about an antibody, anti-P ribosomal antibody in depression of lupus. It was just association, what we are doing right now. But why the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine decided to publish such a patient? Because it was almost the first evident that psychiatric manifestation can be of an autoimmune origin. Many years later, I have to say, we have purified these antibodies. We injected them to a collaborative mice and they developed depression. So it's like an evidence that autoantibodies can cause psychiatric manifestation. And the opposite, that psychiatric manifestation can be of an autoimmune origin. Therefore, the, the trial that you tested, corticosteroid, was not a mistake. Because if it's an of, of autoimmune disease, corticosteroid should help. Not everybody, as you said, not every size for everybody. Thank you. No, uh, it's, a, it's a good point, it's, so, but now we have to proceed. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, the next speaker.